I'm James Whitmore. Danger that spells death is a test of courage. What a man does in that final moment is determined by all the past choices of conscience. This is the story of Naval Lieutenant Frank Ellis and his choice, a story of survival. <laughs> Before they had the means, men wanted to fly. The reasons are practical and romantic, and Americans are especially possessed. Nearly half a million persons in the United States are licensed pilots, and if the cost of buying and maintaining planes were not so high, the sky would be one big traffic jam. Still, each spring, thousands of youngsters test their wings for the first time. For many, this first flight is the beginning of a lifetime career. is World War II. The sky above Tampa, Florida throbs as the Army Air Corps trains combat pilots. To an 11-year-old boy just across the bay in Clearwater, the war only means having an exciting show right in your own backyard. His name is Frank Ellis. We were able to watch some of the neatest dogfights and some of the best flat hatting out over the Gulf. Pilots skimming along the water and raising up to go over the jetties that protruded out into the ocean. And this certainly impressed me. When the Ellis family moves from Florida to Illyrio, Ohio in 1950, Frank Ellis begins to live the adventure he watched as a youngster by taking up flying. I was impressed by the lack of feeling of any speed, primarily because of the altitude at which we were flying. If we had been uh, zipping along the deck, I'm sure I would not have had this feeling, but it just didn't seem like we were moving at all. We were floating rather than speeding through the sky. Being able to soar over the rest of the world, so to speak, that was a very favorable impression, certainly. Frank Ellis finishes high school with flying still high on his list of interests. But it does not hold the urgency of a lifetime career. I knew that the draft board was breathing down my back. So I set out suitcase in hand and hitchhiked out to Colorado where I'd been accepted to get in some type of ROTC program in college. I was just number one interested in getting through college. Number two, getting into naval aviation and seeing what it was like, and then deciding on what type of career I thought I might do best in. While attending the University of Colorado, I had an opportunity to ride with an instructor who I'm sure must have been fearless because he let me try anything. In fact, I recall <laughs> giving a steep nosedive after uh, attempting a loop that I was sure he would have to pull the wings off the airplane to recover from. That ride was certainly a winner where I was concerned. It, it was something that was exhilarating, creating a, a sense of freedom, more a feeling of awe and inspiration, if you will, than anything else, I guess. I, I knew for sure that naval aviation was the thing for me. Equipped with a degree in civil engineering, Frank Ellis has two choices. He can build bridges or fly over them. He decides to postpone bridge building temporarily. 
he applies for the Naval Air Cadet Program. Every year, the Navy graduates around 1,700 aviation cadets from its Pensacola, Florida school. The cost of training just one of these young men is nearly $100,000. Compared with the average price of $8,000 for a four-year college education, the cost is high, but the price is necessary. The flight training program at the time I went through consisted of about six weeks of book learning, essentially, followed by indoctrination and flying. However, I recall thinking, I don't see how in the world these guys ever memorize all these procedures. That was the awkward part initially, just learning these procedures, the emergency procedures, the, the normal operating procedures, so that you could do them boom, 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 just like that, step by step. In the process of training, the hundreds of young men sometimes seem more like so many similar machines than individuals. They learn the same lessons, perform the same tasks, live by the same discipline. This is a necessity of military life, and most of the men understand it. Some, however, find the routine impossible to cope with, and those either leave voluntarily or are weeded out by the Navy. Those who stick are glad that they do. was learning what I thought were nitpicking procedures step by step, one, two, three, A, B, C, but I realized there were a vast number of us to train and that was the most expeditious and safest method of teaching us all the same thing at one time. flying, I didn't seem to grasp rapidly to any uh, great degree of proficiency, yet there are other areas like the formation flying and the acrobatics, things like that, that just came to me immediately almost. After months of being just one trainee of thousands, with all decisions made for him, the cadet reaches a point where he is asked to make a decision, which determines the final phase of his training. There are two basic categories of military planes, fighters and bombers. In the fighters, the pilot is on his own. In the bombers, he is part of a crew. Frank Ellis must decide between one or the other. Very fortunately, when the class I was in went through flight training, they needed jet pilots, and I thought that, gee, every uh, red-blooded young tiger would naturally want to get into jet fighters to whip around the sky. As luck would have it, almost all of us got what we wanted. I think I would have been pretty disappointed had I not been able to. We, upon graduation, had various possibilities for assignment. Certainly, I felt pretty qualified to handle any job that the Navy would give me now. Whatever I did, I hoped very much that it would involve a tremendous amount of flying, but I knew I had a long ways to go before I was a really good, smooth pilot. Lieutenant Frank Ellis has his gold wings. 
but his training is not over. He is to keep up his own training in the latest aircraft and to take on his first Navy assignment as a flight instructor. If a student was plowed back to be a flight instructor, he would only spend an 18-month tour there in the training command and then go on to a fleet-type squadron. Uh, the whole time I was there as an instructor, I just wanted to build up all the flight time I could, get as much actual instrument flying as possible, so that I would be better qualified to handle whatever job might come as far as a fleet assignment. I went to Miramar, outside of San Diego. I was assigned to VRF-32, the aircraft ferry squadron at North Island ferrying new, old, etc. aircraft back and forth across the United States. The work was most enjoyable because of, number one, the variety of aircraft one was able to fly, and two, being able to travel all across the United States delivering aircraft. So it was very educational. And of course, moving these used, in some cases, old aircraft there were times when uh, emergencies would uh, arise, but uh, not much more frequently than they would arise in a squadron. Lieutenant Frank Ellis cashes his paycheck as fast as the next man, but his work is so stimulating that if he could afford it, he would gladly pay to do the job. Even the danger in his work does not affect his enthusiasm. He accepts it as a matter of fact. It is a part of the job but it is not something to fear. Norfolk, I was assigned an F-9 converted into a drone. This particular aircraft was as good and maybe better performing than any I had picked up in the past there, right out of overhaul and repair. Everything was in fine working order. problem on any of the trip, really. Last leg of my journey was from Kirtland Air Force Base, New Mexico, into Point Magoo. Here again, no problems en route. Magoo Tower, this is Navy Jet 28229 for landing, over. Roger, 229, have you in sight. Report the break for runway 21. Approaching the numbers, over. Roger, 229. You're clear to break. Report to base with gear down. You're number two in traffic. Following an A3 turning downwind. 229, Roger. Tally hold my traffic. Magoo Tower, 229 at the 180 with gear down and locked. I'm having a slight trim malfunction, but I'm able to handle it. Roger, 229. Understand trim malfunction, but under control. Well, the A3D should be in your way. 229,
when consciousness returned to me, it was in the hospital there in Oxnard, California, St. John's Hospital. The first thing I do remember was one of the sisters coming to see me just prior to going into the emergency operating room and asking me my religion. And I said, I'm Protestant and I'm not going to die anyway. After I made the break over the runway, I got no response to my trim. I tried the emergency system, which had no effect. I got a violent nose down pitch. I reached up for the face curtain and observed this trailer park in my flight path. Holy mackerel. To try to miss the trailers, I crammed on full power. I was able to alter the heading of the aircraft. When Lieutenant Ellis made the decision to stick with his plane rather than crash into the trailer camp, he put the lives of others over his own. As it turned out, he did not have to pay with his life, but even good fortune has its price. Lieutenant Ellis is just beginning to learn it. He has lost his right leg, and his left leg is so badly mangled it is useless. Lieutenant Ellis is transferred to the San Diego Naval Hospital. The several operations at the Naval Hospital proved unsuccessful. The leg was going to have to go. In fact, I felt it was just delaying my chance of getting back into the air. So I was extremely eager for them to uh, perform the amputation some weeks prior to the time they actually did. I never had any doubts about being able to do the job I had done prior to the accident. Now maybe that's just plain dumb thinking, but I've always been a sort of the optimistic type. I felt that by golly, I could continue to perform in a satisfactory manner with artificial limbs. I was concerned about how can I get the opportunity to prove this? How will I get people to listen? How will I initially start this uh, ball rolling? That was the thing that was on my mind. In January, I was officially released from the hospital and ordered back to the squadron. When I first told people what my plans were, most of them just laughed at me, really literally laughed at me, like I had been affected mentally in addition to physically. I could understand it. They knew what sort of thinking exists, not just in the Navy, in the good old USA, as far as handicapped are concerned, so they thought it was just futile to even try to stay in the Navy, let alone fly. And I decided that certainly I was going to have to prove a number of things pretty graphically. About a month after getting out of the hospital, went through the Navy's water survival, the Dilbert Dunker, parachute drag, underwater swim, tower dive. After that, 